right. There we go. Click us off. Blessing and honor, glory and power, be unto the ancient of days. From every nation, all of creation, bow before the Ancient of Days. Every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory. Every knee shall bow in your throne. In worship you'll be exalted, O God. And your kingdom shall not pass away. Blessing and honor, glory and power, be unto the ancient of days. From every nation, all of creation, bow before the ancient of days. Every tongue in heaven and earth. Shall declare your glory, every knee shall bow in your throne. In worship you be exalted, O God, and your kingdom shall not pass away, O ancient of days. Your kingdom shall reign over all the earth. It's worth singing to the ancient of days. Every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory. Every knee shall bow in your throne. In worship you be exalted, O God. And your kingdom shall not pass away. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. We're glad that you're here today and that you've come to, to worship the Lord. And we're going to continue now as we continue to sing, Holy is the Lord. I've got some extra help up here today. Jim Cook is, is helping play a little bit today. They want to embarrass you, Jim, but I appreciate him coming up. Uh, as, I, as I have found out, many of you uh, have uh, experienced bee stings uh, over the last several weeks, uh, particularly these mean old yellow jackets, you know, and I'm sorry, Jim, that's why I can't be a Georgia Tech fan. Go know? Jackets. Go Jackets. Hate yellow jackets. But anyway, one of them got me on a hand yesterday, and I was afraid I wouldn't be able to play this morning, but uh, I prayed, and evidently somebody else did too, because I'm able to come up and play this morning for you. So, let's continue in worship. Holy is the Lord. Stand and lift up thy hands, for the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship Him now, how great, how awesome is He, and together we sing. Everyone sing. Holy is the Lord, God Almighty. The earth is filled with His 
we had a great week this week. I think I'm on. Had a great week with our vacation Bible school. Children had a great time, didn't you, children? You have a great time? Great. We're going to see a video in a soon to, to, to show some of that fun time. But uh, I, I just want to thank our staff. I mean, man, we have a tremendous staff that's really dedicated. And, you know, I, I've, I've seen they well, I've been involved with VBS over the years, uh, many years, and, and sometimes the staff is there begrudgingly. <laughs> But that has not, has not been the case with our staff, and I, I want to recognize them. First, with Hannah Johnson, who is our uh, children's event coordinator, you did a fantastic job. Yeah. Hannah, thank you. Thank you very much. And, and right beside her was Lauren Uncafer, who is our children's ministry director. Lauren, stand up. They, they work great. They, they are, they're different, but they work great together. So just so they uh, you know, complement each other. But then if, you're, if you worked on the staff in any way uh, this week, uh, stand up. We want to thank you. All of thank you very much. Thank you very much. Every one of you is very important. So, well, I think they have a presentation to make to us or give us. So I'll throw it back to Hannah. Sir, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, yeah, we had a blast last week. We finished up last Thursday um, with our Zoomerang VBS, and it was all about um, just kids learning that they are each created by God, um, wonderfully made, and they're made for a purpose on this earth. Um, we had about 20 to 25 kids there every single day, a lot from the community, and countless volunteers, countless hours. So to reiterate what Pastor said, thank you so much um, for your time, volunteers, and for your support, but also to the congregation. There have been so many donations to come in, and I know prayers were lifted up for this VBS. So thank you all so much. We are going to have a little performance of our theme song, and then you're going to hear that theme song again in the video that we have just to recap the week. So, my friends, I want you to come on up and get on these front two steps. Audrey, would you like to come up? No, it's okay. You can sing from the back, okay? All right, friends, come on up right here on these steps. Come on right here, right toward, scoot over, scoot over right here in the middle. Okay, okay. Remember, you're going to watch me, okay? All right, I think we are ready to go. The western desert hot and dry. The western desert hot and dry. Barren land the cloud the sky. Barren land the cloud the sky. But Jesus makes the desert bloom. But Jesus makes the desert bloom. Living water for me and you. Everywhere. 
desert hot and dry. Western desert hot and dry. Barren land, the cloud, the sky. Barren land, the cloud, the sky. But Jesus makes the desert bloom. But Jesus makes the desert bloom. Living water for me and you. Living water for me and you. Me and you. Sumeray. Everybody everywhere 
time again My life was in His hand He knows my name He knows my every thought And He sees each tear that falls And hears me when I call Well, we continue again our series on the, the Psalms, uh, God's Greatest Hits, uh, Part 2. Great stuff, a deep dive into the Psalms, and we want to um, get in that in just a moment, but before we do, we want to um, bow before the Lord and ask the Lord to prepare our hearts for His meal that He has to give to us. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for this day. Thank You for your love for us. We thank you for VBS, for the opportunity to invest in the lives of children, to share the gospel, and to hear those young ones asking about Jesus, how precious that was. And Father, I pray that you would um, cause the truths that were shared this week to be riveted to the walls of the minds of the young ones, that they would not soon forget these great truths. And for those who perhaps don't know you, I pray, Lord, that they would uh, make a decision to trust you. And now, Father, we pray for all of those in our church. There are those who are still grieving, Lord, and it's a long process. I pray that you'll comfort them. There's some who just struggle with where you have them in life. May you just uh, remind them that you're walking with them. You haven't forgotten them. Father, for those who are struggling physically, who have chronic pain and, and have different Ill, certain illnesses, Lord, may you heal them, at least alleviate the, the pain that they, they experience at this time. We know that you're the great physician, and so we trust you uh, to minister to your people. And now, fathers, we open the word, and we are reminded that it is the Spirit of God who does the teaching, who illuminates us. My job is just to be a vessel, and 
Lord, as feeble as I may be, I pray that you may take your truth and that I might be a vessel, that you might use your truth and, and, and teach to remind, perhaps to admonish, and to strengthen your people. And to that end, may you be glorified, Lord. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Well, I, I uh, grew up, lived in one house for 18 years, and what that house was one block from my elementary school, Galloway. We were the Galloway Gorillas. And, and so Galloway had, of course, like many schools, had this big playground, huge playground. And, uh, and so even in middle school, when I was in middle school, when we'd get back from school or on the weekends, we would, all the guys would congregate at that, that school, at the playground, and we would play either, depending on the season, we would play baseball, uh, sometimes we would play basketball, had great basketball courts. Um, and so uh, during baseball, uh, there was one backstop that was fixed that was, had, a, had, had the best field. And the one thing that we liked about it is because if you continue on, for those who are batting uh, right-handed, right beyond the fence would be where the residential area began. And so it was just far enough for, uh, for us to be able to play baseball, and yet it was close enough that those who could, at least right-handed, those who could hit the ball well could knock it over the fence. Now, that created a problem because when we knock it over the fence, uh, there would be the owner of the house who would come out and say, and, and, and so, and, and so uh, that didn't stop us. We kept doing it nonetheless. We just tried to be a little more careful. But, well, one day we arrived to play baseball and there was this big sign, no trespassing, no trespassing. Now, did we stop sneaking over to get our baseball? No. We we're just even more careful. <laughs> you see, when you, have a, you see a sign that says no trespassing, what, what does it remind you? It says, hey, this is my property. Stay off of it. You could get in trouble. In fact, it is basically saying this is my property, and don't you forget it. <laughs> Well, I think our passage today in Psalm 24 is basically God fixing that sign that says no trespassing. He's saying all that you have, all that you are, all of that belongs to me. I own everything. And you see, there's, there's no property upon which you can walk or claim to own. In fact, you could fly into space, and there's no place you can go that is not owned by God, according to this passage. Well, Psalm 24 is a psalm of David. It's a psalm of David that speaks of a time when the Ark of the Covenant was being carried to the temple grounds, or the tabernacle grounds, the temple grounds had not been built yet. This was on Mount Moriah. But David made sure that there was a tent that was called the tabernacle. And within the tabernacle was, of course, the Holy of Holies. And they were bringing the Ark of the Covenant to place it in the tabernacle. And that's really what this psalm is all about historically. It was sung throughout Israel's history to Remember the entrance of the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. But the picture begins foundationally with the fact that everything in the world, not just the piece of real estate in Jerusalem, but everything in the world, everyone in the world, is owned by God. And, and so I, I wanted you to know that this can have this passage can have far-reaching implications for all of us. I mean, it can change our way of looking at life altogether. I find it, in fact, very interesting that it's, it's very similar to what we read about in Peter. And Peter said, remember, God is coming back. Christ is coming back. 
But what this passage, I think, the, the question that begs, and we always try to begin with a question, what, is, what does David teach us about God's sovereignty and ownership in the world? So let's turn to Psalm 24. We're going to get into that. And of course, as we always do, we want to get into the background before we get into the text itself. Remember, this is a song. All the Psalms were songs. And it was first sang when David and the throng of the Hebrew people are marching the Ark of the Covenant to Mount Moriah. Now, it was, it was sang responsively. Let's just put it in that, that way. Some scholars believe that the high priest would lead the pe- as, as he would lead the people, he would call out a question or make a statement. And of course, just like in re- church, we have responsive reading sometimes. We don't do that as much anymore, probably should. Uh, there would be a response to, from the choir, the people. Now, some scholars think that it was a high priest who was kind of leading the, this responsive s- song or what. But others think that it were perhaps two choirs. We don't know. But there was a response. There was an echo. There was a statement, often a question, and then there would be a response of the people. And this song was paramount. In fact, according to one scholar, according to the teaching of the Talmud, this was a song that the Jewish people, when they were in captivity, would sing out on Sunday, remembering... Christ as the creator, or God as the creator king, I should say. If you were to divide this um, passage up, uh, uh, it, there are really three sections to it. There's the great creator king, or, and then in verses 1 and 2. Then there's the hill of the Lord in verses 3 through 6. And then there's the divine warrior in verses 7 through 10. Now, I think we're ready to read in verse 1. It says, the earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Now, the first thing you want to note is the word Lord. You note that word Lord. It's got a cap- big letter L, but then the rest of the letters are capital letters, uppercase letters. That is to remind you in the King James that this was the name that was used in the Hebrew text that referenced Yahweh. The Jewish people so reverenced the name Yahweh that they were fearful of even using that name. And so what was substituted was the word Lord in its place. And so really, if you were to read it, we'd say the earth is Yahweh's and all it contains. Now, again, the Hebrew people, as they near the city as they were carrying the Ark of the Covenant. They would sing out, and they would sing out questions. And and, and I I have to believe that verse 1, even though it's not recorded, I have to think that the the high priest or perhaps the first choir, depending on who it is, uh, had a question. But there are three questions in this text. If you look in verse 3, it says, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? And then in verse 8, it says, Who is the king of glory? And then verse 10 says, Who is this king of glory? But it points out saying that all that is in the earth, in the world, is it belongs to God. In other words, it's saying the stellar space are his. The, The countless stars and their satellites traveling at inconceivable velocities in giant orbits, are his. In one galaxy amidst 100 million galaxies is the Milky Way. That's the one we are on, right? One, and, and the Milky Way is made up of 100 billion stars spinning around a center in the form of a giant disk of stars. 100,000 light years from rim to rim. In other words, 600 million billion miles of stars, and they are all his. And some 30,000 light years from the center of this this Milky Way is that moderate star known as the sun. He owns that as well. All of it. In fact, what does uh, Isaiah 40 tell us? He calls them what? All by 
name. Can you believe that? You ever feel that God forgets you? That you, you think, God, hey, don't, don't forget me down here? Do you think if he can call all the stars by name, he can remember you? Sure he can. Deuteronomy 10, 14 says, Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the highest heavens, the earth, and all that is in it, in it including all of us. God owns them all. And clearly the intimation is that he owns us in that passage. The creator God made all of the universe and and he owns the universe, and certainly he owns us as well. If you were at the beach, or when you're growing up perhaps, and you, maybe your children do this, and you, you, you know, they build a sand castle, and somebody comes along at some point, maybe a brother or sibling comes along, and they just want to cause you some, some irritation. So what do they do? They kick the side of your sand castle in or something. They step right in the middle of it, and you scream, that. Nah. That's mine. I, I made that. Get lost. Well, why do we claim that? Why, why would a kid claim that? He really doesn't own it, but he made it. Well, here's, here's the principle here. Now, you can believe that, that, that an un, a non-personality being, that something just, this universe just came about by some accident. You can you can believe that if you want to. Good luck with that. But I, I think it's clear, according to Scripture, that there's a designer behind the design. And the designer behind the design says, because I created this, I own this. This is my property. Now, when we say God is sovereign, and really, I think when we say he owns everything, that's, that's what we're talking about. We mean, though, when we use the word in the theological circle, when we say that God is sovereign, we mean that he rules over all. There's no, nothing above him. Nothing has control over him. And, and, but why? Well, the simple answer is that is because he created us. You are... Um, you, you ladies, when someone comes to you and uh, maybe you're at a potluck and you, uh, you have this wonderful dish and, and people come to you and say, hey, I got to have the recipe of that. And you're proud, aren't you? You're proud because they, they like your dish. Well, you made that dish. And so you know what, what goes for making that dish to taste as well as it Taste, because you made it. God made it, made us, and He owns us. And so, who better knows what we need to make our life joyful, fulfilling, purposeful than God Himself? A couple, the implication of this, number one, is that because He created us, He owns us, but also. Because he created us, he has the right to do with his creation whatever he chooses to do. And he knows what's best, just like that recipe. You remember Job? <laughs> I love the story of Job. We, we went through that a few years ago. Job gave God some grief. And in, in the Hebrew text, it says, it literally, literally he, filled, he filled his mouth with arguments. And... Uh, People try to tone that down and say, well, he, just, he was just reasoning with God. No, he was arguing with God. He was causing God some grief. And God came back to him in chapter 38, and what did he say? He said, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. He went on to say, and it was one question after another, where were you when I hung the stars? Since you know so much, Job. <laughs> I, uh, sometimes we try to tell God, what is, uh, what is best, right? He was saying, Job, I'm God who, I'm the God who made you. I own you. You don't own me. Listen to me. Pay, pay attention, he was saying. So what David teaches us about God's sovereignty and ownership is, number one, realize, here's the first point, if you're following the outline, realize God owns you. God owns you. Exodus 19, verse 5 says, Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, 
Then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. What do you say? Now, some, we know that he was speaking to the Jewish people, and especially to those who would trust him as their Messiah. But some would say, well, that's to the Jewish people, and that doesn't apply to, to me. Well, let's think about that for a moment. It does apply to the Jewish people, and God had a promise to them, but in, in the church, we, we are the church, those who have trusted Christ. We have not taken the place of the, the, the people of Israel, the Hebrew believers. But nonetheless, what are we told when we come to Christ? Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, you want to write that down. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, it says, here it is, Do, not, do you not know that your body is the, a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? Now watch this. And that you are not your, what? Say it with me. Oh. For you have been bought with a price, Therefore, glorify God in your body. There, the text tells us essentially what the, the Old Testament text told about the Hebrew people. You've, if you've, the text says you've, if you've trusted Christ, if you know Christ as your Savior, then you're not your own. You've been bought with a price. There's, a, there's an old movie. I've never seen it, but I've read about it. And uh, it, it, was, it was entitled The Hanging Tree. It was, uh, Gary Cooper was a star in, in that movie. He was a doctor in that movie, and so that tells you how long ago it was before my time even. A anyway, in this movie, it, it, it was set in the late 1800s in a western gold mining camp. And um, this young man was caught stealing some of the gold in the camp. Well, Immediately, they try to catch him, and he, he, he tried to get away. But in getting, trying to get away, he, he was wounded. He lived, but he was wounded. And so all the people in the camp couldn't wait to go out and find him. They wanted to be the one, the first, they wanted to be the one that would kill him. But Gary, the story goes that Gary Cooper, the doctor, found him and took him to, back to his place. And he nursed him until finally he, he you know, gained consciousness. And the young boy thinking, you know, what's he going to do with me? He said, he asked the doctor, what are you going to do with me? And here's what the doctor said. The doctor held up the slug. He says, you will be my servant as long as I want you to be, maybe forever, because that's how long you would be dead if the slug had remained in you. <laughs> forever huh. that is the length of condemnation for the slug of sin if it were to remain in us the bible says that we will removed we if we don't trust christ we'll be removed from the opportunity to live with him forever but the, here's the good news that was the bad news the good news is the great physician has already performed surgery to remove that slug when he went to the cross and died for each of us the painless operation of trust in him is the only requirement. Our, it's our privilege to be a servant. But all we need to do is say, Lord Jesus, I need you. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I open the door of my life and receive you as my Savior. Thank you for forgiving my sins and giving me eternal life. Now I ask that you take my life and make me what you want me to be. And God is not as concerned with your words as he is with your heart. Now, let's not forget that we too, as believers in the New Testament, are referred to as servants. The word in, Greek, in the Greek, there are several words, but the one that's most often used, the word doulos. And that is a designation of a class of slaves in the first century that represented the most pitiful abject condition imaginable and yet he calls us his servant now christ died for us and so we willingly he took that slug from us and so we willingly say or should say 
I'm yours. I'm all yours. You own me. And I'm good with that. Now, in the next section, we see that it begins with a question. It says, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord and who may stand in his holy place? Now, in Jerusalem, there were two spots. There was a holy hill and the holy place. The hill is Mount Zion. We looked at that last week, talked about that last week. Mount Zion, in David's day, was crowned with the great Jebusite fortress. In fact, it was called the Citadel of David. Uh, but David, here, we see David is doing something that's very similar to what we saw last week when we looked at Psalm 15. You may recall that. I want you to flip back to Psalm 15 real quickly. In Psalm 15, in verses 1 and 2, he says, O Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may hang out in your tent? Yahweh. Who may dwell on your holy hill? See, it's very, the language here is very similar. David, what David is doing, now, look, Excuse me. The only person who could really dwell in the most holy of holies where the Ark of the Covenant would reside would be the high priest. So David is using this symbolically, and he's saying, Who can enter into your presence? Who can draw no close to you? Again, he's symbolically talking about the type of person or persons who will be in the presence of God. He's not, now listen, it just, and you can go back to chapter 24. But in chapter 24, as he did in Psalm 15, he's saying these are the people who, are, who would be characterized as being close to God. He's not saying this is a means of salvation. He's not saying this is a means of justification. He's not saying if you do these things and then you'll be close to God. No, he's saying if your heart is right, these are the things that will characterize your heart. I used the illustration last week of the Major League All-Star game and how are Major League All-Stars chosen? The game was played this past week, I guess. And uh, how are they chosen? Well, uh, fans choose them. They usually choose their home team, but there are a lot of fans out there that don't live in the major cities where there are baseball teams. And so if you were to say, well, if you're talking to someone, you say, well, how do they get there? I mean, on what basis are they chosen? Well, they, they see, number one, they see they have a high batting average. They have, I mean, they don't have a high percent, uh, fielding percentage. They may not pay as much attention. A high on-base per percentage. These are some things that would characterize the all-stars. Now, it's not, those things are not e exhaustive. And this passage, as it was in Psalm 15, the, the things that are mentioned here are not exhaustive of everything. It's simply saying, hey, you want to know what a type of person is it's going to be in the presence of God? Here's what he will look like. And here's some of the characteristics. And I'm going to walk through these quickly because last week we went through them, spent a considerable amount of time, and so uh, just keep that in mind. But first, it says they have a pure heart. Beginning in verse 4. He who has clean hands and a pure, pure heart. Well, let me back up. He, he, he has a clean, clean hands first. What does this mean? It means their actions are righteous and blameless. doesn't mean they're without sin, but it means they're not characterized and people do not know them as by a reputation of sin. <clears throat> I went to a major denomination, de denominational church in the South, <clears throat> trusted Christ in that church, uh, loved the church, loved the people there. Um, but there was an usher who, why he was allowed to be usher, I don't know. He was a barber. And I was growing up and, and I recommitted my life to Christ and, and um, I was gung-ho about the church. I mean, I, I did everything. I, I sang in the choir. I went to every Bible school you could find. I recommitted my life to Christ and I decided I'd go to the barber shop. Now, I'd heard this reputation about this man and his tongue, but I chose not to believe that, but it was true. 
He was known by the language, the stuff that came out of his mouth. I thought, huh, I'll never go back there. Why are they, why do they even allow this guy to stand in the door? That's the idea here. Number two, they have a pure heart. Their motives are pure and their minds are uncorrupted. Last week we talked about those who love the clout more than they love righteousness, who love being first, who love being recognized, who love having their, you know, James called it selfish ambition. That's what this speaks of. Number three, they do not give themselves to falsehood in any form. Now let me qualify this word. This word, falsehood, has the idea of that which is vain and that which is worthless. And some of your Bibles will translate that idols. And that is a correct translation. In the New American Standard does not make that a distinction, but nonetheless, that's the idea. Now, I think it is significant that David chose to put that in this context. It wasn't in, in, in Psalm 15, but he chose to put it in this context. Now, why? He asked the question, why did he do that? These are the questions that a good Bible student would ask. It may be that he's saying, God, in this, as he begins, he says, God owns you. He is your creator king now does somebody else own you an idol is there an idol in your life that's the idea here and then it says they do not bear false witness they they don't testify falsely against anyone this idea in this particular word has the idea of someone who officially stands on a, a witness stand and who would bear false witness against someone and say, yeah, they did it, yeah, they, but it would obviously include false witness of any kind. In fact, last week in Psalm 15, David used three, four different descriptions talking about the person who attacks his brother or his friend. All of this really says, and that's why I'm, I'm walking through this, is that the person who is found close to God is one who loves doing what is right because they love God. So here's number two. I think this says live like he owns you. Number one, know God owns you. Two, live like he owns you. I think one of the things that has so impressed me in these last two studies in, the, in 15 and in, now in this chapter is how much God wants truth and righteousness in our lives down to the finest details in fact, I think what would help us is, is kind of go back and, 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 and kind of talk about and see the, the beginning of this journey. Of the, now, remember, they're bringing the Ark of the Covenant. But I think it would, what would help us is to go back and remember the story behind the beginning of this journey, the Ark of the Covenant. It began when David, with 30,000 men, went down to Baal, Judah, went to the house of Abinadab, where the Ark of the Covenant was. And so they, they get a new ox cart, and they put the Ark of the Covenant on top of the ox cart. Now this, remember, the Ark of the Covenant represented the presence of God. On top of it was the mercy seat when it was in the Holy of Holies. And so now they're, they're beginning to carry this uh, Ark of the Covenant, the very presence of God, and they come across a threshing floor. Now what's a threshing floor? Well, that's where the wheat was threshed. Think of it this way. You ever been in one of those restaurants that had peanuts all over the floor? Remember that? And so you slip sometimes? Well, apparently the, the, the oxen of one of the, began to slip, and so the ox cart began to tilt, and y Yusa reached back to grab it to keep it. And what happened? God got angry that he touched the ox cart, and he struck him dead. And that made David mad. Now, was David mad at God because he killed Usa? Or what was he, did he just kind of say, throw up his hands? I, there's no way I can get this thing. I, this thing is too holy and too righteous for me to carry it. Now, you think, well, man, that's, uh, that's pretty harsh. <laughs> God killed this guy uh, uh, just for reaching, trying to catch the Ark of the Covenant. And then after all the uh, Ark of the Covenant, they put it on a, on a, a, a new ox cart. Well, this was the end of a series of eras. And this kind of was a culmination. 
Think of this way. The, ox, I mean, the, 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 the Ark of the Covenant, there, there were instructions on how they were to carry the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant would have rings and there would be a poles that would go through those rings and just like we have pallbearers, there would be these guys who would carry this, this Ark of the Covenant. Now imagine for a moment. Funerals. There's certain protocol that goes with having a funeral, doing a funeral. Pastors are given handbooks on how to do funerals. Now, they vary. I've, I've lived in three parts of the country now, and they vary. Uh, the s- south is different than the Midwest, and the Midwest is different than the south, and, of course, California is different than everybody else in this world. And, um, but, but there are certain things that just are uniform, that, you just, that, that are for the dignity of the deceased. You have the, end of, you have the service, and then to the end of the service, the pallbearers sometimes will come down. Sometimes they'll just wait out. They'll, they'll lead them out behind. The pastor leads out the, the casket. That's a protocol. And then there's the family. And then there's the, uh, no, I think the uh, pallbearers come behind, the f- before, behind me. And then there's the family. And then, so uh, just imagine though for a moment. Funeral services are with Doors open, and usually the director will come down the aisle and so forth. But let's just suppose. Let's suppose that the door's open, and here comes one of the pallbearers. He's got one of these giant dollies. You know, you've ever seen him move a a refrigerator. He's got this giant dolly, and he says, I got it. Don't worry about it. I got it. Step back. And he he puts the casket on that dolly and rolls it out. What would you think of that? And say, so it was it's a new dolly. You know, the ox cart was new, remember? No. And that's the idea. God had gave, given specific instructions. And here's my point. My point is this. What we read in these passages is that God is very concerned that we live godly lives, that we do what is right, right down to the very last word that comes out of our mouth. Now, let's look at verse, verses 5 and 6. He shall receive a blessing from the Lord, from Yahweh, and righteousness from the God of salvation. First, let's break that down. First says he shall receive a blessing. He shall receive. I, I, I was reminded this, uh, uh, reminded of Psalm 37, verses 25 through 27. It says, I have been young, and now am old, David says. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his descendants begging for bread. Verse 26, all day long he is gracious and lends and his descendants are, are a blessing. And watch verse 27. Depart from evil and do good. Do what? Do right. Do righteousness. Hmm. So you will abide for. There are blessings for those who truly live a righteous life. And I think sometimes we, as believers, we live Christianity by what I call spiritual uh, relativity or spiritual relativism in the sense that we look at other people and say, well, I'm not as bad as that person, and so, uh, hey, I'm, I'm good with God. No. David lays it all out here for us. And then back in that passage in verse 24, the latter part of verse 6, I should say, or verse 6, or verse 5, I should say. It says, in righteousness from, from the God of his salvation. Now, I want you to make a note of that word salvation. Put deliverance. Put the word deliverance. It's the word salvation. The Hebrew, as its root meaning, as well as in the Greek, has the idea of deliverance. Okay? This is a word, though, here, in this case, in the word righteous, uh, uh, the word right, excuse me, I'm not sure why I said that right. Deliverance has the idea, I mean, uh, salvation has the idea of deliverance. Righteousness here is a legal term that is often translated vindication. Vindication. It, it is, it, so the idea here of righteousness is that he will vindicate us. It's a sense of being at the end of whatever people are, are charging you of, of doing that's wrong or, or 
foolishness that they say you've done or something stupid they say you've done. He's saying at the end of this, for the righteous person who lives according to his prescription, uh, that person will be vindicated. And listen, for those who in a world filled with people who are touting their own autonomy, to say, no, I am God's man, I am God's woman, I live for God, I live in a world for his glory and for his purposes, for those who choose to live that way. There's a lot of mockery to be had. And as I said last week, it's only going to get worse. Are you willing to stand and to say, God, I stand for God. He owns me. He's, he's my life. He concludes this with that phrase, such is a generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. That's kind of, I, I paraphrase that, but basically that's what he's saying there. Now, let's read verse, beginning in verse 7 and catch that last part. It says, lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord, uh, watch this, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of the armies of angels. That's when you read the word hosts, it's talking about the Lord of the army of angels. How about that? He is the king of glory. Now, as you well know, that in Scripture, oftentimes there's typology in the Old Testament. Typology, if, you, if that's hard for you to understand, think of a silhouette. It gives you kind of the outline of a picture of something that is to come. It won't tell you everything about it, but it'll give you a good idea. And, and there are many who would say, or so, I should say some, and not many, there's some who say this is a picture of our Lord's triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Now, that was a triumphant entry, was it not? Our Lord came in, he went to the cross, he died for us. But the language that's used here is not commensurate of our Lord's first entry. It's more conducive to our Lord's return. Let's put up the diagram, Diane, we have that. The diagram that we show you many times is this diagram, we are in the church age, the grace age, and at the end of the grace age, we believe that the church will be raptured before the tribulation. Then the tribulation, the Antichrist will sign a covenant with Israel, and then the tribulation begins, and then there's three and a half years of mild tribulation, then there's three and a half years of when everything breaks loose. But at the end of that tribulation, Jesus is coming back. Yes, he is. The one who died and rose from a grave said, I'm coming back. And so the language that's com that we see here is more commensurate to uh, what we see in Zechariah. So I want you to go to Zechariah, and listen, here's, it's easy to get there. You go to the last book of the Old Testament. Turn left, go back two books. It's right back there. Zechariah. Zechariah 14, and this is a picture, and by the way, here's some trivia for you if you want to know. The greatest counterpart book of the book of Revelation is the book of Zechariah. Not Daniel, as we often think, though Daniel has a lot of eschatology in it. No, it's Zechariah. And as we're reading here, let's read very quickly, it says, Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you will be divided among you. For I will gather all the nations against Israel to battle. And the city will be captured and the houses plundered. And the women ravished and half of the city exiled. But the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. Now listen, there's a lot to be explained in here. and We don't have time to explain. I just want you to read the, catch the language. It says, then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. And in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from the east to the west 
by a very large valley. So that half of the mountain will move towards the north and the other half towards the south. And you will flee by the valley of my mountains, for the valley of the mountains will reach Azel. Yes, you will flee just as you fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. Who are the holy ones with him? See it. It's the church, believers, those who put their faith in Christ. Isn't that going to be a great day? That's happening, folks. That's really going to happen. In that day, there will be no light. The luminaries will dwindle. And for it will be a unique day which is known to the Lord neither day nor night, but it will come about that at evening time there will be light. Now drop down to verse 9. It says, And the Lord will be king over all the earth. Here's the king creator. And in that day the Lord will be the only one in his name the only one. And that word one really kind of takes us back to Deuteronomy 6, 4, where it says the Lord thy God is a cad, one God, compound unity. But now, two more verses. Look at verses 16 and 17. It says, Then it will come about that any who are left of all the nations that went against Jerusalem will go up from year to year to worship, say it, the King, the Lord of There it is, the Lord of the armies of angels, and to celebrate the Feast of Booth. And it will be be that whichever of the families of the earth does not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. So here's the third point. Live like the coming king owns you. Live like the coming king owns you. The Hebrew people had suffered and had suffered and suffered and David said to the people, remember, there's someone who's coming back as king of kings and lord of lords. Peter talked about it as well. He said that's the blessed hope. That's as you suffer, as you go through suffering today, remember there's a day coming when you're going to come back with Jesus and he's going to usher in that millennium and there's going to be the battle of Armageddon. Then there's going to usher in that millennium. By the way, how you live here will determine how much land you own, how you serve, what office you have in the millennium. It's really going to happen, folks. So... What does David teach us about God's sovereignty and his ownership? Number one, what is it? Realize God owns you. Secondly, live like he owns you. And thirdly, live like the coming king owns you. Application, there's one. Begin each day recalibrating your thinking. I am owned by God. Begin the day. Put it on your mirror if you need to. I'm owned by God. So what does God want to do with my life? You may be going off to work, school, whatever. But God wants to use you. He wants to use you wherever he has you planted. I, I've said before, look up. So often we've we're, we got our minds planted in our phone and everything else. Instead of saying, looking up and saying, God, who do you want me to touch? What do you want to, how do you want to use me today? And here's the second thing. Ask God to help you practice having clean hands, right actions, and a pure heart, right motives. In everything that you do. Even if it costs dearly. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word, the power of your word in our lives. We're so thankful that you give us truth to live by. We don't struggle in the dark. We're not desperate. We are given instruction that is empowering. And so, Father, I pray that you would help each one of us today to take to heart these truths. May the Spirit of God take these truths and rivet them to the walls of our mind that you might be glorified in our lives. We pray this in your precious name. Amen. Let's stand and sing that last song together.
redeeming son. No other name would die for me. No other name would cleanse my sin. No other name would set me free. Jesus, your name will have no end. No other name would die for me. No other name would cleanse my sin. No other name would set me free. Jesus, your name will have no end. Jesus, your praise will have no end. Jesus, your name will have no end. Thank you for coming today. God bless you. You're dismissed.